This is the first deep dive on the inner workings of the Zoxnoxious analog synthesizer. We'll go under the hood of this computer-controlled modular analog synthesizer. I'll show how the wiggles get generated, the circuits that control it, whether you're just curious how the Zoxnoxious synth works, or planning your own personal monstrosity with VCV rack or a Raspberry Pi, I think you'll find this walkthrough interesting. We're going to start with the front end, which is what the user of the Zoxnoxia synthesizer interacts with. Future videos will talk about the design of the underlying hardware boards, the Zoxnoxia signal bus that runs between voice cards, and the Raspberry Pi that orchestrates everything. By the end of this video, we'll be out of VCV rack with everything set up for the Raspberry Pi to take control. First off, what is the Zoxnoxia synthesizer? I mean, besides having a funny, unpronounceable name. My original intent was pretty simple. Use a Raspberry Pi to control an analog oscillator. It grew from there. I've been focusing on analog chips for functions such as oscillators and filters. Many of these analog chips showed up in 1980s synthesizers from Sequential, Roland, Oberheim, and others. I shouldn't admit it, but I've got a bunch of Yamaha FM chips I'd like to get in as well, but that's down the road. From there, the Soxnoxia synth morphed into a VCV rack controlled analog synthesizer using a set of voice cards. And that's the big deal here. Pick any set of voice cards to plug in and assemble the synthesizer for the moment, all controlled from VCV rack. Why VCV rack? Mainly, I didn't want to develop a limited set of hardware controls. In looking for Euro rack flexibility without the hardware, I found VCV rack to be a good target. VCV rack is open source many third-party developers, and there's an excellent forum for with helpful people. For this to work, I needed VCV rack to send control voltages to the voice cards. Setting up a Raspberry Pi between the VCV rack host computer and the voice cards worked great for this. The VCV rack host computer, be it Mac, Linux, or Windows, would just need to interface with to the Raspberry Pi and do it in a way that is platform independent to the VCV rack host. I keep mentioning VCV Rack and have not introduced it. VCV Rack is open source software that provides a virtual URAC modular synthesizer environment. Virtual patch cables connect to virtual modules and virtual signals flow. VCV Rack also has a slick UI. Drag modules and add patch cables to build whatever you want. Many third party developers create their own modules for VCV Rack, and these are available in Rack's library. You're not going to find Zoxnoxious modules in the VCV Rack library, at least not yet. The Zoxnoxious hardware is in a do-it-yourself state, and the Rack modules aren't useful without the hardware. In modeling the Zoxnoxious synth in the VCV Rack software, recall the synthesizer is a sum of individual voice cards. It's straightforward to make each voice card an individual module in Rack. That gives a one-to-one -one relationship between the voice card and the associated VCV Rack module. If you've got multiple voice cards of the same type, say for example three oscillator boards, you can just add that oscillator to VCV rack three times. So that's pretty useful for abstracting out the hardware. From the rack user perspective, handling the VCV rack control voltages to the Zoxnoxious modules should be straightforward. The rack user sets up a patch as is typical in the environment. The Zoxnoxious modules accept control voltages and provide panel buttons or switches that exist in the underlying hardware. That makes patching to inputs on Zoxnoxious modules work the same as standard VCV rack components. One can use any VCV rack sequencer, envelope, LFO, or other module and attach patch cables to inputs on the Zoxnoxious modules for control. In a minute, we'll go under the hood to show how these signals get out of VCV rack to the hardware. Later videos will show how we get to di a digital analog converter and send these signals to analog circuits. And similar with the buttons, the front end modules communicate to the underlying hardware that a button was pushed and to change signal routing between voice cards. Going back to the high level diagram, let's do this one step at a time, as there's a lot involved in getting from the software rack module to the Raspberry Pi and out to a voice card. A big part of it is the backplane. We'll talk a lot more about this card in future videos when we discuss the hardware, but for purposes of the front end, I call this the audio out module. In this context, let's just say the audio out uses the backplane hardware to get signals to its output jacks. The audio out has a Raspberry Pi, which connects to the host computer running VCV rack. Plug in the USB cable between the Raspberry Pi and the host computer that runs VCV rack.
Now, let's go back to VCV Rack. After plugging in a USB cable, there's a number of devices made available to the host computer. We need to set these so AudioOut can send and receive data over USB. The AudioOut has a context menu to set each interface. Use this to set MIDI out, MIDI in, and two audio interfaces. This allows AudioOut to communicate with the Zoxnosh's hardware. These interfaces are largely lifted from VCVRAC's core components, such as the Audio 16, MIDI out, and MIDI in devices. A bit of magic happens once the interfaces are set. Audio out status light turns green, showing the hardware is connected. The audio out sources list activates, indicating which physical cards are present in the system. Any Zoxnosh's module connected to the left of audio out will have its output identified, and any further modules connected to the left will also have their outputs identified, assuming the associated Zoxnosh's voice card is present. Let's go down a layer or two. We're going to get more technical. The audio out starts by sending a MIDI system exclusive message requesting which voice cards are present. Responding over MIDI, the Raspberry Pi replies with a discovery report. The discovery report is used to populate the audio out sources list. Then, from that discovery report, the audio out creates a message called a command message in the Zoxnosh's code to pass it to its adjacent left rack module. A Zoxnosh's module receiving the command will interpret, modify, and continue passing the message to its left. This all makes use of the VCV rack expander functions. Using VCV rack's expander methods, adjacent modules can pass messages, which means the virtual modules need to be physically touching. I mean, virtually physically touching. Well, adjacent. Let's go with adjacent. So conscious modules use the expander interface to pass their command messages to the adjacent left module. This Zoxnosh's command message tells what hardware cards are present and how a module can communicate to that voice card. A Zoxnosh's module receiving a command message will take ownership of an available matching voice card. For example, a Zoxnosh's VCO rack module would choose to take ownership of the first unallocated VCO hardware card it finds in the command message. Before passing the message to its left, the VCO will modify the message to say that this hardware card is spoken for. That way, no other VCO module will take ownership of the card. In this example, there's no physical card available for the last VCO. Sad Panda. That handles assignment of hardware cards to software rack modules. That's cool, but it's nothing really synthesizer-like so far. Let's talk about getting the control voltages sent out. After all, that's what drives the circuits. Recall that Audio Out holds device interfaces for USB MIDI and USB audio. We need a way to send control voltages and patch info for each Zoxnosh's module to the audio out. For this, again, we turn to VCV Rack's expander interface. Instead of going right to left, we go left to right. Starting from the left, each Zoxnosh's module fills in channels in an audio frame, representing its current control voltages. The exact channels each module uses were prescribed by the command messages that audio out sent previously. For example, the VCO requires six channels, the VCF card uses seven channels, and the audio out uses two channels. These might be mapped as channels 1 through 6 on the VCO, 7 through 13 for the VCF, and 14 to 15 on the audio out. Each module fills in its channels and passes the audio frame along to the right. Other data, such as button pushes or selection changes, are also sent left to right as MIDI messages. The frame of audio and MIDI is chained along to the right until it reaches the audio out module. The audio out takes the frame and sends it as USB audio down the wire to the Raspberry Pi. Similar with any MIDI message, those go to the MIDI out. Now we've got control voltages and MIDI data sent out from the host computer. The next deep dive video is going to cover receiving that message in the Raspberry Pi and handling it there. Would it have been nice to have a single interface, either just MIDI or just audio? And how did the Zoxnosh synth wind up like this? There's reasons for combining audio and MIDI. Each have their advantages in specific scenarios. To recap the requirements for the Zoxnosh synthesizer, we need to send control voltages, patch info, and relay system configuration. Here's how the audio and MIDI interfaces stack up to each other for these use cases. First item, the type of control. The audio interface is purely an amplitude for a channel. 
and that's great for control voltages. Not so much for patch info. MIDI works a lot better there. For channels of control, the audio interface has 54 distinct channels. MIDI has significantly more if you consider continuous controllers and various MIDI channels, and completely open if you roll your own with system exclusive messages. So why not send control voltages over MIDI? That'd be a fair solution, right? Oh, wait, standard MIDI messages provide only 7 bits of data. And sure, there's non-standard ways around that, but that wasn't the direction I wanted to go. The audio interface is configured for 16-bit, more than enough for control voltages. A compelling reason to use audio for control voltages is the steady stream of data via the 4 kHz audio interface. The operating system will set up and handle buffering for the frames of samples. The receiving side can set up a timer and adjust as needed to follow the stream. The audio interface works well for this. When I discuss the Raspberry Pi in an upcoming video, we'll see audio samples can be memory mapped, which amounts to being more efficient. The MIDI interface doesn't support that. For MIDI, I'm using it for event-driven actions, such as user interaction of changing a patch or setting a tune request. That's right, auto-tune of oscillators and filters is supported. One final note, it's best not to mix and match between protocols. In other words, handling some control voltages as audio and some control voltages as MIDI would be bad. The underlying operating system, both sending and receiving data, is going to handle buffering differently between audio and MIDI. One should not expect them to be exactly synchronized with each other. So that's why both MIDI and audio interfaces are used. So that was a quick run through of the front end of the Zoxnot synthesizer. Future videos will be building on some of the concepts and be getting a lot more technical with how the voice cards are designed and discuss functions of the Raspberry Pi which sits between the boards and the front end. Everything is open source on GitHub if you want to explore on your own. And do let me know what questions you've got or comment on what you'd like to see in other videos. Thanks for watching.